This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, our weekly 15-minute-ish podcast covering the top three things on our mind as we make the turn from the past week to the one ahead for the week of March 12, 2018. We are a bit behind in posting this week's edition. We've been traveling, and each time we have gone to record, the issues have kept moving. But we finally had the chance to sit down in one place long enough to record, and the issues seem to have stayed still, at least for the moment. In addition to this podcast, we also will be on the Amy Domboski Talk Radio Show this Friday afternoon from 4.15 to 4.45, discussing a few of these same issues with guest host Todd Smolden. Be sure to catch our discussion there also if you have the time. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week you can follow and participate in the discussion with us on news and commentary of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. You also can find this and past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and on my website at bgkeithley.com. This week, our top three issues are these. Constitutionalizing the PFD, the budget and statutory spending caps, and Alaska LNG. Let's start with the issue of constitutionalizing the PFD. That issue has arisen in both the Senate and the House uh, within the past couple of weeks. In the Senate, uh, a proposal by Senator Bill Wilikowski that was co-authored by Senator Mike Dunleavy when he was still in the Senate, uh, two opposite ends of the spectrum, uh, has been pending before the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, for, uh, well, since last session. Senator Wilikowski has tried twice to, on the floor of the Senate, to to move the bill beyond uh, both times. uh, It's been that proposal beyond Senate Judiciary both times that proposal has been rejected on the Senate floor, and the Chairman of Senate Judiciary, John Coghill, has not only not has not only not given any indication that he intends to move the bill forward. Indeed, he wrote uh, an editorial in the past couple of weeks that appeared in several of the state's papers, arguing why we shouldn't constitutionalize the PFD. A fairly clear indication he has no intention of moving the bill uh, through his committee. On the House side. Uh, the House Finance Committee this week uh, took up a proposal that had been uh, filed last session uh, by Representative Chris Tuck, among others, uh, proposing to constitutionalize the PFD in a different way and at a different percentage. The proposal on the Senate side by Senator Wilikowski, Senator Dunleavy, was to constitutionalize a 50% draw consistent with the current statute. On the House side, the proposal by Representative Tuck and others was to constitutionalize a PFD equal to only 33% of the uh, revenues coming from the permanent fund, leaving 67% uh, to government. Uh, a, a significant difference uh, between what uh, from what had been proposed on the Senate side. The House took up the proposal, and the indications were that they intended to move forward with it. But in the, in the run-up to the public testimony they held on the bill earlier this week, uh, they made significant changes to the proposal. Uh, they did not change the 33%, so they still kept that below the 50%. But they changed the language of the bill so that the permanent fund dividend was no longer guaranteed, uh, as it is in the, uh, on the, Senate, in, in the Senate proposal. The House changed a critical word, the word shall uh, uh, distribute uh, 33% in the House's case, uh, ultimately to the dividend, to the word may, uh, which frankly makes that provision uh, entirely avoidable by the legislature at any given point, uh, and indeed by the governor, even if the legislature would pass it, would give the governor the the power to uh, veto Uh, any appropriation to the PFD. In the testimony that that resulted from that, there was significant, indeed, nearly unanimous pushback from those testifying, uh, both against the 33% uh, 
uh, allocation, but also against the use of the word may. Several making the point that it was uh, sort of a useless act to, if, you, if, if your goal was to constitutionalize and protect the PFD, using the word may sort of made it a useless act because it just left uh, the uh, provision, well, the, the, the opportunity for a PFD in the same place it is now, which is subject to legislative uh, and uh, gubernatorial uh, whim from year to year. Our view on constitutionalization, there, there was also, to, to say one more thing about that, there was also a rationale given by the chair of the committee, um, uh, co-chair of the committee, Representative Paul Seaton, that the change in the word shall to may was legally required. Uh, he had received an opinion from the Ledge Legal Counsel uh, to the effect that uh, if the if the if the purpose was to require the transfer of funds out of the permanent fund to the PFD and bypass the appropriations process, uh, that that was a change that couldn't be made by constitutional amendment, uh, but had to be changed by constitutional convention. Uh, and the difference between an amendment and a convention is significant. A convention, uh, if one were called would open up the Constitution to all sorts of changes, not just the narrow one of addressing this particular issue. An amendment, on the other hand, would 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 change just that constitutional provision. It wouldn't open everything up. So Seton used that, Representative Seton used that as an excuse for changing the word shall to may, uh, which then led to uh, the testimony by the public that it was what the what the House was proposing was sort of a useless act. We disagree with the alleged legal opinion. Uh, we've written on that in our uh, on our Facebook page and elsewhere. Uh, if you want to dig down into why we think that's uh, a bad uh, a bad decision, uh, but to us the more important reason is what should we be constitutionalizing? Frankly, we think there's a different there's a problem with both of the Senate and the House approaches uh, to constitutionalization. The Senate approach would uh, merely uh, constitutionalize the current statute. And as we've talked about, was as we talked about on last week's program and previous programs, there is a problem uh, with the current statute once government starts uh, taking money, its share, uh, the other half of the of the of the revenue stream to help fund government. The problem is that that is that half is where uh, uh, inflation proofing t typically or historically has been taken out. And so if you, if you just constitutionalize the current statute, uh, what's going to happen is inflation proofing will come out of the other half. Uh, and the remainder, which is just about 25% of the revenue stream will go to government. We think that's a problem because that won't fund government sufficiently to, uh, uh, uh keep it whole and will push government then closer to uh, pursuing taxes and other new revenue measures uh, when they otherwise might not if they had the full 50% of the revenue stream. Um, so we think there's a problem with merely constitutionalizing the current statute. That statute, the approach needs to be changed now that government's starting to take its 50%. We've talked on previous programs about how to do that. We won't repeat it here. But, but we think constitutionalizing the existing statute would just would just be an enormous problem. On the other hand, the House approach, uh, which only includes 33% of the revenue stream, uh, is also problematic. Even if they overcome the word, even if they change the word from may back to shall, you're still cutting the PFD. And as, and as we've discussed on previous programs, ICER has clearly said, the ICER analysis has clearly said, that cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy and is by far the costliest to Alaska families of all of the new revenue options. So in especially in the midst of a recession, it's the very last thing you want to be doing. You don't want to be hurting the economy more than you have to, than other alternatives, uh, and you don't want to be hurting Alaska families more. Uh, than other alternatives. You should be taking those other alternatives first. So cutting the PFD, as the House approach uh, 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 suggests, uh, 
uh, we think is highly uh, problematic also. In response to the in response to the House request for comments, we said we opposed the House uh, proposal, but at the same time, we submitted comments that said, this is what we think uh, a constitutional amendment should look like. We're not going to have time on today's program to go into detail on what those comments were on what that proposal was. You can find it on our Facebook page uh, or on uh, our uh, SlideShare page, actually. Uh, if you want to dig into it. Uh, but suffice it to, to say, we think that in addition to telling the House no uh, on, it, on its proposal, that it's important to tell them yes, uh, that they should be constitutionalizing, uh, and here's the way to do it, and here's the way to, to format it uh, going forward. We have hopes that the House will continue down the road of looking at constitutional constitutionalizing the PFD, but do it on, in, in light of the comments they've gotten, do it on a much improved basis using 50-50, shall, and some other things that we, suggest, we suggest in our comments. Uh, we support the House continuing down a road of constitutionalizing uh, if they go in the direction of improving the product that they've been dealing with thus far. Uh, certainly, we'll be talking about this issue on future programs. Second issue we want to talk about this week is a proposal, a bill that's currently uh, in uh, working around, working through the Senate that would impose statutory limits uh, on spending uh, what is sometimes referred to as the spending cap legislation. Uh, that proposal uh, has worked its way through the initial committee in the Senate and is now before Senate finance uh, and likely will uh be passed by Senate Finance. It would purport to reduce uh, current spending levels to somewhere in the neighborhood of $4.1 billion, but there's exceptions and there is additions and uh, and you really can't <laughs> you really can't tell uh, exactly what the legislation would do. But separate and apart from that, the legislation frankly isn't even worth the paper it's written on. In the Supreme Court's decision last year on the PFD, the Supreme Court held that regardless of what is in statute, uh, the legislature can appropriate whatever it wants, basically, or not appropriate. In the case of the PFD, there's a statute that says the legislature shall uh, uh, appropriate, basically, uh, shall cause the, the permanent fund corporation to transfer to the permanent fund uh, uh, dividend office 50% uh, of the of the revenues coming into the earnings, uh, coming about fifty percent of the five-year average of the revenues coming into the into the earnings reserve. The Supreme Court said, though, the legislature can ignore that word "shall" in statute and set uh, the appropriation at a lower level or presumably a higher level. Uh, it doesn't have to pay attention to the statute. So, when the let a fiscal statute. So when the Legislature is the Senate is is crowing about, puffing about, uh, working on this legislation that would set spending limits uh, by statute. It's worthless because under the Supreme Court's decision on the PFD, the le uh, the next legislature, heck, even this legislature, could ignore it uh, in in setting future budget levels. They could say, well, that's nice. And even if it says, even if the statute ends up saying shall, they could say, well, that's very nice, but we're going to ignore it. And this, the effect of the Supreme court's permanent fund decision would be to uphold that, uh, to say the legislature can't ignore it. All the legis all the Senate is doing with this piece of legislation is trying to create a campaign tool to go out and say, look what we did. We passed spending limits. Well, they didn't. What they did was pass a piece of paper that that they can crow about, that they can campaign on, but that doesn't do a thing because of the Supreme Court's decision. If you want to do something about spending, get it under control. Reduce it down to long-term sustain sustainable levels. Do the hard work of going into the appropriations bills and bringing it down. But don't claim that you're doing something material by passing a statute that has a spending cap. The other alternative, if you want to be doing something about it, uh, 
is to go into the constitutional provision that already has a spending cap. It's ineffective because it's too high, but there's already one in there, and amend it. Amend it to make it effective. Put it in the Constitution. And with a spending cap in the Constitution, then you've got something that the legislature would have to would have to agree to. But rather than doing that, the Senate wants to spend its time talking about this great statute that they're working on that would be a statutory spending cap. It doesn't do a thing. Any time spent on it is a waste of time. Any credibility given to it is wrong, is useless, uh, and we and 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 it gives them the ability to ignore yet again doing the hard work of of bringing spending down. The final segment this week is on uh, LNG, uh, and there's a lot of moving parts going on with the Alaska LNG project. Uh, FERC has issued uh, an order that. Uh, gives a timetable to the environmental review, the environmental impact statement review that the FERC is going to undertake in advance of uh, issuing a certificate for uh, the export facilities that are being built, including the pipeline. Uh, President Trump uh, has uh, imposed tariffs of 25% on steel, which Senator Murkowski and Senator Sullivan uh, have both said would negatively impact the cost uh, of the pipeline, raise the impact uh, of the uh, of the pipeline uh, because a large portion of the steel for the pipeline itself uh, would uh, necessarily must come from foreign sources. Uh, there isn't a U.S. steel plant that can make a pipe of that size, uh, and so the tariffs on steel uh, potentially negatively impact cost. Uh, this is a challenge. This is a cost challenge project. Uh, in any event, so raising any segment of the cost uh, uh, makes the project all the more uh, uh, difficult. President Trump also has talked about essentially going to a trade war, going into a trade war with China uh, that would uh, Im, uh, impose additional tariffs in, on other products, leading China to retaliate, impose tariffs on U.S. products, uh, deteriorating the U.S.-China uh, uh, business relationship. Uh, in a way that could, frankly, negatively impact uh, China's view of the Alaska LNG project. If I were sitting in China, I would say, well, the U.S. is going to, you know, from time to time could go off the deep end and try to uh, pass legislation or executive acts that would that would disrupt Chinese U.S. business. Why should we be buying from U.S. sources, tying ourselves to U.S. sources? There's a lot, there's a lot of negativity uh, that's occurring in this situation. But let me say one thing that's positive that we need to keep our eye on. The reason President Trump's going down these, this road uh, is because he's concerned about the imbalance of trade between China and the U.S. The U.S. imports a heck of a lot more uh, in value from China than China does from the U.S. Huge imbalance of trade between the China between China and the U.S., uh, what President Trump is trying to do, if you sort of read through this and understand what the, the, the pieces as they're put together, what President Trump is trying to do is to get the Chinese to do things that would improve the balance of trade uh, between the U.S. and China. Uh, and that would mean the Chinese would import more U.S. products uh, into China uh, potentially reduce also the amount of exports from China into the U.S., but I think the focus is getting China to import more uh, from the U.S. A big piece of those imports would be LNG, would be energy from the U.S. Big value in that, big dollars in that, would do a lot. Uh, uh, the importation of LNG would do a lot uh, to help uh, offset the balance of trade. The importation of LNG from the U.S. would do a lot to help offset the balance of trade. Um, and the Alaska project is so big, has such a big volume to it, that it would have a significant effect on the balance of trade, would significantly improve the relationship uh, or, the, or the, the, the trade between uh, the U.S., the amount of imports, the value of imports going into China from the U.S. So if you look through all this, all of these little pieces that are going on, at least from the, the trade war standpoint, uh, are are focused on 
getting China to improve the balance of trade, presumably if China takes steps that would improve the balance of trade, the, this administration would back off uh, the various penalties that they're trying to, that they're talking about imposing on, uh, on China, the various trade uh, tariffs that they're talking about imposing on China. So from, from that perspective, this, this noise that's going on actually may improve the prospects uh, of uh, the Alaska LNG project by getting China, moving China toward improving the balance of, the, the balance of trade, looking for things to import from the U.S., and, and focusing it even more uh, on the Alaska LNG project uh, going forward. That's an important consideration. Uh, and frankly, one we need to keep our eye on because, because frankly, it's 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 a critical. It, it is probably the biggest motivation uh, for this project uh, uh, proving to be successful. The FERC uh, timeline uh, notification is problematic. It moves the project back a year from where the AGDC wanted it to be. Frankly, that may be okay. Uh, because we need to go through this trade war first to sort of figure out where that's going to land uh, and, and, and can afford the additional time that, that FERC is, gonna, is going to take. Um, and there is a positive in the fact that FERC at least gave the project some timeline. There had been some concern earlier this year, late last year, that the FERC was going to continue putting off the timeline uh, uh, until AGDC had a number of other pieces of information brought together and uh, put into FERC. Um, so it's a it's the FERC timeline is a problem, maybe not that big of a problem though, depending upon what happens with the trade war. Um, and a year probably isn't that critical to the project uh, in any event, if the Chinese are inclined to make this project work a year slide in the project uh, isn't going to cause them suddenly to veer off course. It's going to take something else to cause them to veer off course. Long story short, a lot of moving parts around AGDC, a lot of about around the Alaska LNG project, things to be concerned about, things to follow. But at the end of the day, I don't think all of this noise that we're currently seeing makes the project, kills the project, makes the project worse off. Uh, and in fact, as I said, with respect to the trade war aspects, if the Chinese are motivated to improve the balance of trade, uh, may even improve uh, at the end of the day, all, the, all this noise level may even improve uh, the project. Something to follow going forward. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.